Hello and welcome to episode 57 of the Large Format Photography Podcast. My name is Simon Forster and I'm joined by Andrew Bartram, Eric Mathy and Sandy King. Hello Andrew. Hi Simon. Hello Eric. Hey Simon. And hello Sandy. Hello, Simon. <laughs> um, this this is where we now celebrate um, the the introduction where I've actually managed to get through and, and not slaughter the guest our guest's name. So uh, it's great to have you with us, Sandy. Um, and, uh, and before we get going, I just want to say thank you to Eric. Um, with the last episode of the Large Format Photography Podcast, when he interviewed uh, all of the Roland Tubes Collective. So, uh, great job on that one, Eric. Thank you. It was a ton of fun. I'm sorry you two couldn't be there. You would have enjoyed it tremendously. No doubt. No doubt at all. Um, so, uh, moving on, let's head over to the Fens um, and Andrew Bartram, and uh, where we can introduce our next guest. Yes, I'm very pleased to. So, um, we're joined today by the aforementioned Sandy King. And Sandy's been on my radar for many, many years, but largely just in, I say just, <laughs> in relation of staining developers and in particular his development of PyroCat HD, which uh, I know has a great fan base amongst the uh, LFPP Facebook group and, and others. Um, but Sandy's much more, much more. Raised, um, born and raised in Louisiana, uh, see, I did my research. As a young man, Sandy studied in Quebec. He, he went in Belgium and Spain, and then he did a PhD in Spanish literature from Louisiana State University. In 1971, he began teaching at Clemson University, and he was there until he retired from teaching in 2006. And now Sandy lives in South Carolina. Sandy King, this is your life. No, it's not. No, this is the LFPP. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's that's all accurate. Yeah. <laughs> Good, because I read it off your website, so I would hope so. So, fill in the gaps for me, Sandy. Um, you know, we've just we is a very potted history taking us up to two thousand and six. But um, tell us a bit about your background and um, what uh, what you're up to these days. Well, those are two big long stories. <laughs> I know. Yes. <laughs> well, um, well, the background is uh, is. That's who I am. I was born in um, uh, central Louisiana, um, but I had a French uh, uh, a gra- a grand- grandmother who taught me a little French and uh, inspired in me a desire to to travel and to and to learn um, more of the language, which is which was still spoken in Louisiana at the time I was uh, growing up. I think it's largely disappeared as much of louisiana is disappearing from uh, the uh the, the rise in sea levels and the drop in elevation of louisiana itself but um uh, i um i wanted to travel and uh and and learn about other places and you know perfect my language skills so as a young man i went to quebec and then i later went to uh Belgium and studied. Uh, I learned some French, you know, from my grandmother, as I mentioned, and uh, I'd uh, learn more in school. And then I decided I wanted to go study in in France for a year. And I made plans to do that. But somewhere along the line, I got, uh, you know, Northern Europe was in the summer to me in that time, kind of dreary. So I kind of wanted to get out of it, so I actually I had like twenty dollars to my name. My mother was actually sending me cash at the time to live on, and so I had a twenty dollar bill, and I took it and I um, sent all of my luggage to the southernmost point in Spain that I could see in Granada, and then I got out on the road and hitchhiked, and amazingly I made it in um, in um, like. 15 hours or less, maybe. I had only had two, needed two rides all the way to Barcelona. Really? Yes. That's impressive. Yes, it, 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 it happened. <laughs> uh, uh, You're the luckiest hitchhiker I've ever met, my friend. <laughs> well, back then, it was probably, you know, pretty pretty uh, safe to hitchhike. Although, I did have a high school uh, schoolmate who was killed picking up uh, someone. So uh, I wasn't totally oblivious to to the dangers. But uh, 
but that was you know a long time ago. That was in the that was in the sixties, uh, and so I got to Barcelona and uh, I loved Spain right away. And then I went on down to Granada and I spent uh, most of the rest of the summer there. And then I stayed there for another uh, you know two years, uh, learning the language and studying uh, language and literature and various things. Then I went back to LSU and I um, and I decided to do a PhD uh, doctorate there at uh, at the university. I did uh, along the way. I had done some photography and I got very interested in it when I was uh, graduate school and I had a little space that I could create a dark room. I got so interested in it that I uh, thought about going, you know, changing my studies and doing and studying photography. But by that time I was pretty far advanced on my doctorate and uh and uh and I thought I couldn't uh also had already married and had a child, so I thought I couldn't couldn't throw away that um, security. Um, so I didn't. I uh, stayed with the photography as a hobby, and uh, and little by little, I, you know, my interest uh, got you know deeper and deeper. And I would say at some point, um, my all of my interests converged. Uh, as as a as a professor of uh, Spanish literature and at Clemson, I was expected to do uh, research and publications. And my re- my research area was uh, 17th century Spanish theater, and I kind of lost a little interest in it. You know, to be honest, I mean, it wasn't. It was a it was a big thing in Spain as. As that as that theater of the 17th century is in England, but in this country, virtually no one knows anything about it. So um, it wasn't something I could talk about. Uh, and so I decided to uh, bridge out a little bit and to bring together my personal uh, hobby, his interest, which is photography, and my background, which is literary criticism and art and uh, learning to look at different media and analyze them and be critical of them. So I started um, reading about uh, photography, uh, the the medium, uh, and studying it. And uh, so that was kind of a convergence of my personal and uh, professional interest. And uh, that went, that led me to, to do um, research on the history of Spanish uh, pictorialism, and I published uh, several books in that area. I've done, a, um, if I say one of the things I've done in my life is I've done a lot of writing. I mean, writing is a is a skill that not everybody has, even though they're 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 educated and trained. They still are not able to to, to you know sit down and write, and it's it's very appreciated. <laughs> in the university medium when you've got to write reports and things like that. So I had done a lot of writing and the, and then the research that I did in the, in the history of uh, Spanish photography kind of paralleled all of my other interests in history of Spain and the literature of Spain, the critical literature. And so I did some pretty um, original uh, work there in terms of uh, I did a book uh, studying in the, in the 1980s. I did a book uh, that was published in first in English called the, the Photographic Impressionist of Spain, and then it was translated into Spanish and published at uh, at a very prestigious art museum in uh, in Bilbao, in, well in Tarragos in northern Spain. And then from there, I had an invitation to do a couple of other books in Spain. So I've done that writing, and then. Uh, even after I uh, retired, uh, my friend Sam Wong, who was a professor of art at Clemson University with me, uh, started taking me to Spain with him on his trips. And I, he had uh, many, many connections. And one of the connections was a professor in art at Nanjing Institute of the Arts. And he wanted to, you know, spread the word about handcrafted photographs that many of us in the States were doing, which fairly almost unknown in Spain, I mean in China. So uh, so Sam said, well, let, let's, let's, do, let's do a book. I, you know, I, our friend there wants to publish it, and he has the, 
he has the resources and uh, the means to do so. I said, well, I don't really want to write anymore. You know, I, I'd been a department head at Clemson. I wrote hundreds of uh, personnel evaluations. I was department chair of 40 people. I had to write a two-page evaluation for every one of them yeah, uh, one, that's, once a that's, year. That's not fun writing at all. No, no. And then even after I wasn't department head, you know, I was a... I was I was chair of the peer evaluation committee and had to write the darn evaluations again, so I was kind of written out. But he said, "Well, let's do this book. You know, it's it's it can be. You know, well, I did it, and it was a it was a great uh, uh, thing for me to do because from the book, I became very well known in um, China, and I have done a lot of exhibitions and uh, and uh, I've uh, sold a lot of work." Through, 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 through the people there that I met. So, uh, but the gist of this is that I've, I've done a lot of writings on, on aesthetics and um, art, but virtually no one knows about those because they're all in Spanish or in Chinese. And I've done a lot of writing in English on, uh, on process. So that's how people basically uh, no, ma'am. But I, I, I've done both things, and I'm, I'm interested in, highly interested in both things. You know, writing and, and, um, and, and criticism as well as, as process aspects. You know, it's, it's art and medium to me. They're all the same thing. So, well, you're you're very much the perfect guest, at least as far as I'm concerned, Sandy, because, you know, we we don't want to be accused of just being all about the process you know something about ideas and uh, and thoughts uh, uh, together with the activity of, of printmaking and you know, using large format equipment is if we can strike that balance with guests then that's great and sometimes we do and and sometimes we don't sandy you um you talked about the skill of being able to you know write and and i, I just wrote down here writing in a clear and concise mat manner and you're right i think you know, when I started getting into staining developers, if I can steer you down that path in the time that I've got left with you, Sandy, when I started um, doing some research and saying, what the heck is a staining developer? You only have to enter staining developers in Google. And of course, your name, your name comes up and it links to that technical article that's available via your uh, website, uh, which I think is sandyking.com, but we can cover that later. And it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, pretty a pretty detailed article, but and yet you do manage to put it across in a in a f fairly understandable way. I think Simon read it before the show, and 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 even Simon yeah, understood bits of it. I, I, I did. I mean, I, and we were we were talking about that, and because we did talk about in one of the very early episodes with Matt Marash. Um, and uh, he's um, a Pyrocat, Pyrocat HD user, which we, I'm sure we're going to be talking about very, very soon. And uh, and we did talk about stain development at the time, but we were also trying to get uh, the zone system into my thick head. Um, so me trying to absorb the zone system and staining developers at the same time, which pretty much <laughs> meant that I didn't really absorb much of either. Um, but um, but reading um, reading that article, um, yes, there there are things about staining developers now that I understand, and I also understand why um, they apparently reduce grain as well, which is uh, interesting. Which I'm no doubt again will come on to because you can tell that story far better than I can. But so, Sandy, how did you go from you know, writing about Spanish pictorialists with no, I guess, no background in in chemistry, at least you haven't mentioned it, to... Uh, uh, no, I had, I had a background in, um, I had a background in uh, science and chemistry. I, I, in fact, I was destined to be a, 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 a you know, a, a petroleum engineer. You know? Oh, right. Oh, well, you, le you left that bit out, didn't you? Just to, yeah, to... My father was a, uh, was a petroleum engineer. Um, right. Okay. So, so you had that interest there, and at some point, you got interested in photography in your journeys, presumably, and yes. you started developing films. I guess. Yes. So what, what? And how did? So you you went to a you know a, a store, a drugstore, whatever, whatever you went to, and you you bought some film, you bought some developers, or someone showed you. I sure and, did. And what's yeah. that? What was that process that led you from developing your first film to, you know, this this beautiful article on Pyrocat <laughs> HD? <laughs> well, yes, you're right. I went to a camera store and I bought some film and I bought some developer and uh, 
I took it home and I shot the film and I mixed the developer and I and I and I and I did that and I uh, I continued you know with that I was fascinated with it I mean I really was and um, it was mesmerizing it was also uh, relief from uh, from study you know I would, I would work all day and uh, hmm. yeah you know graduate school is pretty uh, uh, hard to do I mean it's very contentious and, and a lot of competition so. I would, uh, you know, it was a way of relaxation. And I did that for quite a number of years. Um, uh, I, that was uh, from the 60s all the way through, you know, the 70s. And I had 35 millimeter cameras and I had some good um, uh, roll film, uh, single lens reflex cameras, a Bronica, and I had an old uh, Rolly, Rolly Flex. Uh, so I made, I developed, and I made prints, and you know, in the in the dark room, silver prints, and I made slides, uh, you know, with my cameras, and I was pretty, you know, I was pretty happy doing what I did. But um, honestly, it was not until I got involved with the view camera that I really became a good photographer, and uh, that was in 1978. Uh, so about, um, you know. Ten years after I started working in photography, someone got me interested in a in a large format camera, and the first one was um, Crown Graphic, and I found it, you know, very exciting. Uh, but I could immediately see that uh, it had, for me, limitations of movements uh, and, and so forth. So, so I looked around and I bought then an old five by seven Corona, and uh, I started working with the film. And uh, and that was mesmerizing. I mean, to me, um, working with the camera on a tripod serves the purpose of slowing down everything that you do and makes you look at the um, thing that you're photographing with a uh, deeper eye. And uh, my photography improved a lot. Well, I wanted to, but I was still you know, not hitting my negatives right in the dark room. You know, I developed for so much time and it wouldn't work out, you know, to, to the right contrast. So they were a little difficult to print. Um, well, I knew that they were, you know, there was sensitometry. But um, uh, I got to that in two ways. One is I started making carbon prints. And I really desperately needed to hit the the density range of the carbon negative because there's almost no latitude when you're printing with carbon. It's not like albumin or platinum where you can overexpose and you just kind of make it a little murky. If you overexpose or have over contrast, the highlights just go off. In other words, they're, they're white. And uh, as a photographer, I really love long scale uh, prints where all of the tones are there from the deepest shadow to the highest highlights so i had i learned that i had to improve my my uh my, my skills in the developing so i learned to to uh, sensitometry and to analyze my negatives and how long to develop them based on uh based on time and uh dilution and then uh and then I applied that to the carbon printing, and then I was fortunate because my friend Sam Wong had a friend who's happened in Phil Davis, who is the creator of the zone of the zone system, uh, and beyond the zone system. He yeah. has a book on that. Yeah, I have that. Yeah, don't understand it, but I have it. <laughs> well, um, it is difficult. It is <laughs> difficult to understand, and, and I had a. I had a, a guy from uh, Florida one time was talking to me about it, and he had done a workshop with Phil Davis, and he had read the book, and he said, well, you know, it would be better if Phil just put a, uh, you know, a nude girl every five pages in that book to give you some... Uh, <laughs> Reason to keep reading it. <laughs> so, uh, and that's, and that's yeah. true. I mean, it was a very difficult read for me the first time I went at it, because I... I didn't know what uh, I'd forgotten what logarithms were and uh, all these things. So, yes. but oh Lord, the uh, being able to master it uh, just opens you know vast doors to me in terms of processing. Well, I think it does, Sandy. So just to stop you, then you talked about logarithms. I mean, so many people um, 
I think don't even download the PDF sheet from, say, if you were using HP5 or FP4. If you download that sheet, it shows that little characteristic curve, and people will mm-hmm. perhaps blank over when they see it. But mm-hmm. um, And it has density uh, along the upright axis and mm-hmm. relative log exposure along the bottom. Now, you don't... Uh, you don't need to get hung up in that, really, do you? You just, I mean, to, for me, I just understand that point three of that relative log density is um, is a stop, and so that's right, isn't it? And then you can count, that's, you can, you correct. can, you can start somewhere down near the bottom of the curve where the where the shadows are, and then you can go up towards the highlights and kind of work out how many stops that film can contain. Um, yeah, you know, but under, you, that, that that's put you in the upper. 0.5 percent of, of technical truth. knowledge of all from yeah all, truth of all yeah things. i know but, sandy i know i know a lot i know a little bit about a lot of stuff <laughs> that's the trouble <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. well, but that, that does yeah. help you differentiate you can then look at different films can't you you can see that's the slope of that curve Absolutely. from one is different to another and that's how con naturally sort of contrasty but then but then if you look on your technical uh, uh, article you can talk about uh, how you develop it to get different slopes of the curve and stuff, and so it's 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 really useful stuff. Yes, and that really comes from the uh, learning the beyond the zone system and the tools that I use to to to, um, to make the curves and you know to analyze them, and that really comes from da- Phil Davis's beyond the zone system, and then my own uh, work. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I don't think I could have developed the PowerCat uh, developer without having, uh, you know, a method of uh, testing, you know, that was very accurate. Okay. Well, let, let's let's zone zone in, zoom in um, on to, on to zone in Z- zone system. Z- zone zoom in. zoom works. zoom in or zone in on on, on this because uh, d- why? Tell us a little about staining developers. Why we should all be using them. <laughs> um, what the benefits are over, you know, surface acting developers or, you know, whatever. That's a bold statement. Why, mm. should, we Why should we all be using them? Or maybe, <laughs> maybe talk about, uh, t- take a step back further from there and say, well, what sort of developers is our film photography? What choices do we have out there, Sandy? If you're able to just explain to our listeners a little bit about the different choices and, and where staining developers fit into that choice. Well, sure. Well, uh, staining developers were among the first uh, of all uh, uh, developers, and they were used in the 19th century. Um, and uh, they continue to be used for a long, long time, in, uh, you know, with film photography, large format film photography. Michael Smith, uh, the photographer who died a couple of years ago, you know, was, a, was an avid user of, uh, of, of a Pyro developer that Edward Weston used. Uh, you know, it's called the ABC. Yeah. Uh, Pyro developers uh, differ from traditional developers in one of two important ways. Uh, one is that um, the, the, uh, the pyro uh, stain, it, it also is a hardening uh, element, and it hardens the gelatin, and, and that means that and you have highly luminous areas with uh, highlights and shadows next to each other, the fine area is hardened and it prevents uh, spread of the image during the course of the development. And that gives greater sharpness. Uh, now, all other developers are already very sharp, you know, and so the gain is not great, maybe 20 or 30 uh, percent, and you don't always need all of the sharpness. But they, they're really outstanding, especially in uh, if you've got... Uh, uh, sun against a tree or something like that. You've seen people do illustrations where they they photograph the tree and the sun and and it's you know it's all there together. You know it's not uh, spread out and so the halo. That's one of the reasons. And then the stain also uh, is, is there in place of silver because you you know if you got some stain you don't need as much silver deposits. And stain has no. Uh, has no noise. It's just, it's just a smooth, uh, smooth stain. So uh, basically, you know, for some some films, uh, it it uh, makes the uh, grain tonal grain much 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 finer and not as obtrusive. So uh, 
uh, and that's one of the two main reasons that people would uh, would want to use staining developers. And what about um, so so? You mentioned that people like Ed Weston was using ABC Pyro, and when you start to do some res- even basic research online about it, you'll see reference to ABC Pyro. You'll you can look back in old journals of photography and see different py- references for Pyro recipes. Um, I, I was first came into it as a, uh, and I was using PMK Pyro, and I used uh, Barry Thornton developed uh, pre. Uh, well, what was it? Uh, Pre-Sicol, was it? pre Casol, however you pronounce it. And then there was Diazactyl, and I think they're all various, you know, mixing two baths together. And um, uh, So how did you what, – what, what was – to put it coarsely, what was wrong with all those other staining developers, and why is PyroCat HD a step along the progression? You know, why, why is it – I use the word better, but maybe inadvisedly. Why, why, but I'll say it anyway. Why is it better than those other staining developers? Well, here's the thing. We're all experiment. We're into experimentation. If you're into photography, you you're, should be interested in experimentation because that's mm. what photography is. And we want to do things better. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm, uh, I have never been satisfied, you know, with anything that I've done. I want to do it better. And so uh, I... Um, Yes, I, I, I followed the same path that you did. Uh, my my window to PyroCat, I mean Pyro developers was PMK, and uh, I also uh, knew um, uh, Barry Thornton's work and uh, uh, wasn't pressed at all. That was a that was another uh, Pyro developer that was mm-hmm. actually. Uh, 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 a basic, you know, theft of my power cat. Uh, but but Barrett Thornton didn't do that. It was one of some. It was one of the guys in the UK. I mean, I don't know who it was, but he he just copied my uh, my whole the whole thing that I had about power cat and just put it on his website. Call it Pressy Salt. Ah. Okay. So is that was that? I mean, the Barry Thornton is. No that wasn't with Barry. It. That wasn't Barry Thornton. Let me be. Oh, that. Oh no, that was the other guy who. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. What was his name? So we. He, he yeah, won't we listen. No, we we won't mention his name. But I know who you mean. He then started selling it, didn't he? Um, yes, ma'am. After Barry. <laughs> um, but that. But begin. That was not Barry Thornton. Barry no. Thornton, no. Very accomplished uh, photographer, and he did great yes. work. And, um, yeah, the other, the other guy who's now, I think he's now sells property anyway, <laughs> but that's by the by. I know who you mean. Well, I, I can't know you... remember. Barry Thornton had a very fine uh, power developer also, and I can't remember the name of it. Maybe it was Diaxtol. That was Di, Di, Zac, D-I-X-A-C-T-O-L, Di, yes. Zac, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, Peter Hogan, that's the guy, the other chap you're thinking of. I'm, I'm not slandering him. Uh, P- did, did you Peter Hogan was <laughs> I, I did say that out loud. Peter Hogan took over the... Um, the formula i think oh. and and they've kind of and renamed it or rebranded it but yes. I, I, or yeah. maybe copied you I that, so, yeah, sue yeah, me. That, yeah I that last would be the appropriate thing. <laughs> and I, I mean, that was a fine uh, photographer uh 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 from the uk that i did workshops with him and i and he knew that guy and i said mm. well ask him about this because you know it's like it's the exact same thing that i'm using the, the dilutions are the same the the mm. uh, the instructions were copied <laughs> from my website. Mm. I said, ask him about it. <laughs> if, it if it walks like a duck and did, sounds he, like he, a duck. He, 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 he just uh, wouldn't say anything. So yeah. I thought, well, okay. Well, me, yeah, I know. But no, Barry, have, Thorn- Barry, have... Thornton, Barry Thornton produced some lovely work and some lovely books, his two books he published. Absolutely. And then he, he, he documented his journey through striving towards a perfect developer, didn't he? And he, yes. he started on the two bath developer, and then he tweaked like the metal levels in the two bath to get his own two bath formula, and then so on it went. And then he hit on the pyro um, avenue. He was a wonderful photographer, and he mm. did great, um, great work. He sure yeah. was. I have to still have his book, and uh, then I learned, and I learned from it. It was one of the books that I read on my way to to do right. the uh, pyro cat. Yes, right, okay, and um, and. Uh, and then, um, so I did that uh, article, um, and uh, 
wrote it um, after I did a lot of four or five years of research and um, experimentation. And I first published the article on PowerCat in a, in a journal. Uh, on the un- was that the Unblinking Eye? Uh, no. Well, I published it there, yes. But I mm-hmm. had a preliminary article on it in a, a little, little magazine that Judy Seigel in New York published uh, on alternative printing processes. And uh, then, uh, and then, a lot of people picked it up from from there, and and then I had the chance to publish it in Unblinking Eye. But the one in Unblinking Eye was a uh, was somewhat later, and I I changed the name to to Power Cat on on a, on the uh, recommendation of Judy Seigel, who was the direct who was the head of that uh, journal, and. Uh, and so that was kind of a, a phenomena. I mean, in terms of uh, popularity. Cause so, what was, so sorry, Sandy. What were the what were the shortcomings of say Pyrocat HD? I don't know much of not Pyrocat HD, uh, PMK Pyro, or indeed Edward Weston's ABC Pyro. What were the what were the things that you didn't like about those, which you wanted to fix, if you like, in in what then became Pyrocat HD? Yes, oxidation is too fast. So mm. if you look in some of the early um, reviews of uh, PMK, they would recommend, okay, you were developing a long period of time in order to to reduce the amount of stain you get, which is undesirable. You know, you, you get, uh, you have to, to split, split develop, you know, pour out the developer after halfway through and then pour in the other. And that's what people are routinely doing. And I was actually personally doing uh, rotary processing uh you know, in a tube and uh, not a Jobo, but, uh, you know, but a tube, you know, the, the way Jobo works. And uh, and I was getting heavy stains. So I just wanted to improve on that. That was my that was my goal. Also, uh, I had, um, you know, I had read that uh, that the Phenodon would provide uh, more in more synergy uh, with uh with a with a power gal what with well with power catkin, which is another, you know, reducer. So I yep. was interested in, in, in playing with that. And then okay. so that was the primary uh thing that I did was you know, change the two chemicals in order to reduce oxidation. Yeah, because if you read generally about oxidation uh, about rotary development in, unless you start digging deeper, it says oh you need to avoid pyro developers because of the you know because of the oxidation so that means effectively they become exhausted before because the rotary effect is kind of churning up i suppose the development exactly you know, you know it's it's exposing it to air and and the air the oxidation process is uh, is degrading the developer before it can complete its its work i i, I would imagine um, That's exactly right. so pmk uh, Pyrocat HD is is better in that regard, but you still, I think, recommend a fairly slow rotation of those um, devices. You know? I mean, on the yeah, on I, the on the Jobo, I think the modern Jobo. I mean, I've got an old CPE two, and that's got a twenty five and seventy five speed on it. Um, but I think Jobo recommend doing everything on the fast speed. Yes, yeah, so and probably for you know most developers, it is it is better. Mm. Um, and. Um, the ultimate, the last configuration of um, PowerCat that I did incorporated ascorbic acid in place of some of the other ingredients, sodium um, okay. bisulfate, and um, and that uh, also slows down the uh, oxidation quite a right. bit. Right. So, so it's it's the one that I uh, use. You know, the only one that I still use. Is that the formula that you can find when you look on, or like photographer's formula? They they sell it, don't they? In the state, is that that? Is that the one? No, they do not sell the HDC. Uh, the, the one I'm talking about is the HDC. Oh, okay, right. Oh, and, I'm uh, familiar with that. And there's not a um, the only the only there was a PowerCat website uh, that was put up by someone I knew, but it, 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 it elapsed, and then there's a guy from the UK who. I forget his name, but he still uh, has a uh, the time you know the time machine <laughs> version of it available, and that formula is available there. Okay, I'll have a little look for that. See if we can find it for the show notes. A little note before I have to shoot off, Sandy. On st- now, this stain, this staining, which as you've already said, helps um, smooth out 
tonality and and uh, you know by by filling in the let me just say filling in the gaps and the, the grain mm -hmm. and uh, making it less grainy. Uh, but image color, uh, most of us these days will be in the darkroom, will be printing on variable contrast papers. Um, uh, some people, I guess, will still be using fixed grade papers, um, but uh, and then other people will be doing taking their negatives for alternative processes. Talk to talk to the uh, listeners a little bit, Sandy, about image stain color because it's different, isn't it, between Pyrocat HD and PMK Pyro, and then um, explain the benefits of one color over another, please. Well, that that that's a, a lot to to talk about. Uh, you got six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, basically, uh, variable contrast papers are uh, sensitive to blue and green light, and fixed contrast papers, and nearly all. You know, alternative processes, you know, well, the garotypes only blue light, yeah. but most variable, the most fixed papers like silver chloride papers are uh, just one correct contrast. They're sensitive to blue light and maybe yeah. UV light, but not not green light. So the green light is, of course, in nature. It's in the sky. You know, when you when you when you take photographs, so. If you have a developer that is sensitive to green light, it performs a filter of the uh, sky. So what what most people notice is that when they when they go out and they photograph in very you know when there's sunlight, and blue skies, it's much easier for them to control the contrast of the sky in printing directly, you know, with variable contrast papers, than it is with uh, than than with traditional developers for 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 fixed contrast papers, it really does not make any difference. The only because there's no you know there's no green sensitivity in, in the, the paper. contrast papers. So the only thing that matters there is the is the basic uh, smoothing that the grain does. The the color doesn't make any. So the, the stain color, if I'm if I'm thinking properly now, you get in in Pyrocat HD. It's more of a more of a greeny color. That's right, mm -hmm. isn't it? And then PM, no, but P, P, PMK was more brownie. Is that is that right? Uh, well, I think it's usually the opposite of that. Oh, the other, the opposite. Yeah. Is it? I forget. PMK Sorry. PMK is yeah. kind of green, and Pyrocat is a little on the brown. Okay. Side. Well, I had a fifty percent chance of getting it right. <laughs> you did. Uh, you, you did well. <laughs> <laughs> Put the coin. Yeah. But uh, so that's the essential difference of our for printing. So for variable. So in summary, for just to put it into. Not naughty language. Uh, I don't know if you know who naughty is, but anyway, uh, in, for naughty language, um, for vari variable contrast printing, which the vast majority, I'm sure, of us um, use variable contrast printers uh, papers. The, the the stain color with Pyrocat HD is 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 much more helpful for controlling those highlights, uh, which you can easily lose, can't you, if you if you develop overdevelop a, a, a film and the, going back to that curve the highlights just end up shooting up um, and either going flat so they just become a constant density or they just shoot straight off the uh, off the scale so that that's exactly right andrew the you, you the uh the the color gives a compression in the highlight yeah. that's very useful when you're shooting uh mm. things like that that are very high contrast high tonal values and one last question before I dive out of this um, fascinating podcast. Um, it, are all films that are commercially available out there, are they all equally suitable for developing in Pyrocat HD or, or some that you would say mm, maybe not or other things to look out for uh, when using specific films? Well, they're all equally suitable for Pyrocat or other developers, but they're not all equal. Uh, right. They... Some films have the ability to expand their uh, uh, what do we call development expanding n plus one or sub mm -hmm. so that you can get a, a wider tone of range in, uh, in the films. And, uh, and some are very poor for this. Foma is a very poor film. It's you can't do much with it. It's cheaper. Uh, it's cheaper. 
and sometimes that's that's what people need. Uh, but uh, Across is a great film. Uh, T Max uh, one hundred and four hundred were great. Films. Ilford F P yeah. four is pretty inexpensive, and it's a great film for that. Yeah, H P five and F P four. I've loved the results so far in Pirate yeah. Cat HD, and I have I have to confess I have developed some foma pan in it. But I, I, I and I'm not sure whether I want to continue. Uh, I think I might. For my large format work, um, if I'm, you know, I'm not going to be exposing thousands of sheets. So, okay, Fomapan is half the price of Ilford HP5 or FP4. But for, you know, the workflow and for, you know, just buy the Ilford stuff and and get the result that you like rather than being such a cheapskate. (laughs) Hey, and, you're support, and you're supporting, you know, Ilford too. I know, and I do, and I do good, that. I'm very conscious thing, of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but FOMA is, you know, perfectly, perfectly fine for a lot of, uh, you know, yep. work that you would do yeah. if you don't need to, you know, expand the the contrast. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Right. Um, Simon and Eric and Sandy, I'm going to have to leave you, and listeners, I'm going to have to leave you in the capable hands of uh, Simon, who can. Um, ask all the dim questions, and Eric can ask all the clever ones. <laughs> wow. Wow. Nice to talk to you, Eric. Wow. <laughs> you have um, and I'm going to try and leave the conversation, and I think if I just hang up, that'll probably be it. So thank you very much, Sandy. It's been a real honour and a pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Um, and Andrew, uh, while, yep. while you're still there, um, mm-hmm. let's let's do your uh, your your outro bits. And, uh, so oh, right. How can, okay. how can people um, catch up with you and see the things that you do and all that kind of stuff so I don't have to remember <laughs> later? Yeah, well, on sort of social media, Twitter, I'm known as War Boys Snapper. And you can listen to me periodically on the Lensless podcast, which is all about pinhole photography. And you can find me hanging out quite often in uh, several Facebook groups, but um, our own one, of course, the Large Format Photography Facebook group, which is lovely and cuddly. And has 1,600, 1,600 members now, so I'm getting a bit concerned that it's Wait, getting too what? big. Yeah, 1,600 uh, odd members. Yeah. Emphasis on odd. Odd. Yeah. yeah. But we do have group experts to help you out, so that's fine. <laughs> no, I was going to say, note, note that I've not been made an expert. No. <laughs> I was say same here. And I, I didn't I make myself one either. <laughs> All right, thank, thank, thank you, Andrew. Um, that, that's great. And, um, yeah, have a good rest of your day um, that you're going to have a, things like that. Have a smooth mm. rest of your day, my friend. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll update you. Okay. okay. Cheers. Sure you um, um, uh, S- Sandy, um, the, the, I've got a, a, qu- a pyro-related question. Um, actually, Ooh, I've, got two, I've, got, I've got two. I've got two pyro-related questions. The first one is, um, for um, I've, I've got a a part A and part B bottle of Pyrocat HD. And I'm looking at it, it's on the shelf and I've had it on the shelf now for 18 months uh, Mm -hmm. because um, when, when I first heard about this, I thought I've got to get some of this. And then when I got it, um, this also coincided with the time where I, I was still, I mean, I still count myself as a beginner with large format photography, but I was very, very much a beginner uh, back then. And I saw, oh, this is two bottles and I was a little intimidated and I've not been back to it since. And I, and I, I wish to, but, um, <laughs> but I'm just looking, looking at these, these two bottles, though they're like well sealed and they're, they're taped and I got them from uh, wet plate, wet plate supplies, um, mix, mix this up and um in the uk and the part b bottle has got some uh, crusting efflorescence or something going on on the outside of it um which has not encouraged me um, <laughs> and, um so so I'm, the, my, my question there is have, have i missed the boat on this or is it or do i need to worry about it or and and get some new stuff or is it going to be okay do you think uh, yes, uh, actually, the the stuff in, in the part A bottle uh, is, is what really goes. I mean, because it's the uh, reducing element. The part B is what we call, and it's film developing the accelerator, uh, and it's uh, it's a it's a almost um, saturated solution of, uh, of, of you know a certain chemical, and that and that's done at a certain temperature when it's mixed. If it falls out of solution, not because it gets cold, as it might um, in um, 
as it might in the UK. I mean, you know, um, it's a lot probably, you know, colder there than it is where I live in southern U.S. Uh, plus, we have, you know, conditioned climates all the time. But if it falls, the temperature falls below uh, 60 or so, that, uh, uh, that potassium um, uh, will fall out of the solution and it'll cause these crystals in the bottom. The, the key to, to, to getting it back into solution is to put it in hot water and just right. leave it for a while and shake it oh. and it will, it will be fine. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, that, that's, that's also, oh, go on, go on, Eric. I also no, advise, uh, if you've got the solution in plastic uh, containers, I also advise transferring those to glass uh, because, you know, nothing can seep out of the glass. Yeah, yeah. But uh, by economy-wise, they, they, they provide it in, uh, in, in plastic containers. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's good news. And the second question I've got, um, and this is, this is something that uh, um, there's, there's another pyro that's, that's doing the rounds at the moment, in, certainly in the UK. Um, there's, there's a fair bit of talk about it. And there was a show, uh, it's called The Photography Show, uh, last week. And a chap that, um, I mean, he didn't, he didn't make it, as in literally de design it and come up with a formula, but he has the, um, the, the rights to sell it commercially in the UK. Um, and it's um, James Lane, uh, is, is, his name is not to be confused with Jason Lane, who's another person completely different. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he is making, and I bought some as well, because it sounded amazing. Although, actually, the things that make Pyrocat HD sound good also sound good with this. So, But I've got one of each now. I'm excited about both of them, and, and uh, I need to do something with them. But, uh, and that's 510 Pyro. And um, which comes in a single a single bottle, uh, which for simple people like me is, is 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 quite appealing because that's that's one less thing to mix. But um, I'm just just wondering what the the, the differences or are between say if, uh, I assume you're familiar with five ten pyro. Um, yes. And, I, and I'm just just wondering what the differences are between the the two types of pyro. Yes. Um, uh, Jay Defer is uh, the uh, the inventor of that, and the, and the formula is uh, available, uh, you know, online. Uh, so uh, uh, it's it's the difference basically between it and uh, PowerCAD is that first it's it's one part and that makes it uh, somewhat easier to use because you know it, you you expect people to be able to mix one plus one plus one hundred fairly easily, but some people can't when it's very small amounts. So uh, uh, the uh, PowerCat 510 is just one solution. It's mixed in, uh, I think it's polypropylene, and uh, you just uh, uh, you just add water to it, and it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. So that, that eliminates a number of um, problems that some people have. Uh, with uh, with the power cat, I've, I've read so many cases of failure of power cat because uh, you know it didn't turn out right, and usually they're because the people didn't mix the two parts together or they mixed it in unusual proportions. So so in this sense, uh, uh, the five ten is is, a, is an easier to use formula. It's also a, a pyrogallo based reducer. Uh, I forget what uh, the other components are, are it all, of it are, but it's uh, it uses um, uh, the original uh, like pyrogallo uh, and not pyrocatkin. Mm -hmm. So it's you know it's different. I you know I don't find much difference. I've I've tried it and so forth. I don't in terms of quality of work. It's to me they're pretty much uh, similar. But uh, yeah, I have to say it is it is easier to use because it's just one part to to water. I, I know that there are there are some films that um, <clears throat> that it, it's it's not compatible with. It's compatible with most films. Um, I know that there was one film. I don't know if you have it over in the states. Uh, Bur I'm not sure if it's Burger or Burger. 
uh, with two two R's in there. And um, although it's been explained to me what the reason is twice now, uh, I can't quite remember what it is, but it's something to do with how it, how it hardens the film, I believe. Um, so I don't know if that sounds like the same kind of... If, if, if Power Cut HD would do a similar thing or, or not, I, I don't know. Uh... Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I, I've, I've used the burger film, but that was, you know, in the past, so I'm not familiar with the current, uh, you know, formula for it. But a lot of these uh, new films are, are have a very soft uh, emulsion, and uh, actually the hardening that takes place in the power kit is good for them, because otherwise, you know, when, when you finish developing, it's, it's very soft mm. and can flake off. So, so I would think that either uh, the 510 or PowerCat HD would work better with uh, a film like that. Now, you know, as far as I know, PowerCat and PowerGallo developers work with all films. They they do a better job with all films than uh, than the other. You know, although you may not be able to see the difference in most cases, but specifically in terms of the emulsion. I'm sure that the power kit and 510 will work fine with a film that has a soft gelatin because what it does is hardens it and, and you don't want it to be soft. Yeah. Right. That rings a bell actually. I think it's because it, I'm not sure if it's like double sided or something. And I think it like. Uh, oh, well, well, that's a problem. Yes. Yeah. I mean, double sided x ray film and those kinds of things, that's a problem for any, any developer because you, you, you have to keep it from rubbing on, uh, you know, and it's very soft. It, if it's a double siding film and you have to develop it in you know a tray or something it's it's almost impossible to do it without scratching it if it has a very soft emulsion yeah. um yeah. I, i'm just going to say for all those listeners who actually know what they're talking about there i apologize <laughs> because um, you know i've gone with the question there that i only half know something about it so um but, but thank you for uh, for for doing a doing a good job of uh, answering my half baked question there sandy you're very welcome well, it's a, I mean, for the double-sided emulsion ones, actually, if you're going to do those, I mean, a lot of people will develop them, you know, to put glass in the tray to try to keep it from scraping. But really, the only good way to do it is dip and dunk, right, underneath the red light with film hangers, because that way you're absolutely guaranteed that every piece of film is in a hanger and you're done. Or possibly for the folks who have the ability to put it in a, t- in a tube, right, and do the roll, then that's pretty safe too, but you know, not everybody has those. But you know, when I was learning how to develop X-ray film and getting into sheet film in general, um, Rayco, which is sadly long gone in San Francisco, had a dedicated sheet film room with all the equipment for the dip and dunk, and I would just put my own red light in there so it was safe because it's orthochromatic film, and I would just, you know, smooth as glass. Mm-hmm. Just the, the best way, to, for me anyways, I've ever found the best way to develop sheet film was just the dip and dunk from tank to tank, and it worked so incredibly well. Yeah, um, that works well for a lot of, um, you know, processes. If you had, if you had the tanks, that they, they, uh, they were very common uh, back, in, yeah. back in the day, 5x7, 8x10 trays. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it, it, some people even developed for PowerCat uh, special... Uh, Plays that are aerated with uh, nitrogen, you know, so you don't. Oh, fancy! <laughs> that's a little too much for me. But I, yeah. I have developed the X-ray film two-sided and in a tray without any, any scratching, uh, and it wasn't. You, you know, I just slosh it around a little bit. Um, yeah. I, you only care about. Well, you care about both sides in the sense that uh, you get light through them. But as long as the one side is smooth, you're fine. Right. Yeah, I'm notoriously ham-handed, so I will. If it can be scratched, I will scratch it. You will scratch it. Oh, I will scratch the hell out of it. Um, which actually, I was curious before we possibly switch to um, some other topics. I'm actually uh, fascinated. I looked up while you we were talking earlier uh, Spanish pictorialism. I'm like, ooh, look at these guys. They do some really cool stuff. Um, but I do uh, shoot a fair bit of. Uh, paper negatives and also paper positives lately reverse processing um and pretty much just with what have i been using um rodenol because it's the developer i had and it's not a paper developer but i found a recipe so i went with it um 
But for, if you're doing paper negatives and you really want to get a really good tonal range, will PowerCat will, will PowerCat work well for that too? Is a paper negative because Andrew was talking about you know using it for printing, but um, what about if you're shooting a paper negative? No, I would I would I wouldn't use um, PowerCat. You need a okay. Uh, you, need, you need a stronger acting uh, developer to create the contrast. PowerCat is for a film that has a potentially long exposure range, and the paper is uh, actually needs uh, is 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 very hard to begin with. So right. So I, I would a, a developer like Dactol uh, is better than um, than a film developer for for paper. Yeah. Oh, everyone says to use Dactol. I just didn't have any, and I don't have a dark room, so I was like, well, I've got some road and all here. Oh, let's find out. Well, Actually, it's it's, too bad. used it in a very, very high dilution. Uh, yep. What's the normal dilution of Rodinol, 1 to 50 or something like that? Yeah, 1 to 50 I mean, for me, like it, 1 to 100, you know. Yeah, if you used it 1 to 5, it, you know, it, it may work, but they're probably less expensive. Uh, yeah. It's it's 1 to 10, actually. <laughs> That's what I ended up doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds like that might, you know, work, but they're probably better ways to do it but if it's what yeah. you have it's you know it's what you, the best thing to use is what you have you know it's like your camera you know people say the best camera is the one you have with you and that's yep. that's really true yeah absolutely and i guess if, i mean once i run through this batch that i mixed up um i'll probably get some deck tall or something but at the time i was like eh, i'm gonna experiment i have some old road and all and i'm not really using it so let's try it and it actually works which actually makes a really nice negative. In this case, it makes a really nice positive because I've been doing um, Ethan Moses's reverse process with citric acid, like uh, citric acid powder, basically that you buy from a grocery store, and twelve percent hydrogen peroxide for the for the bleach and everything else. It works really well for just like household chemicals that won't absolutely kill you. I mean, twelve percent hydrogen peroxide is not good for you. But it's not like some of the other more industrial uh, chemistry that's usually used for reverse processing. Um, it works well. I recommend it. It's fun. If, if it would be a lowly person like me and use paper negatives. <laughs> well, that reversal process was one of the uh, very early um, uh, in, in inventions. And uh, it could have uh, dominated the industry, but it turns out that the the other negative to positive process, uh, uh, you know, did, you know, dominate uh, as it were. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting that, cause it does date from the very early days of, of photography and uh, the guy who created it is just basically unknown compared to Talbot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I've, I've, I've even forgotten his name, uh, you know, now I have to, I know I read it about it, but uh, it was about along the same same years. Say the How was? Because there are several really interesting processes back then. Um, I mean, salt prints were usually salt print. They were negatives before people used them for printing. And Talbot had his, and then daguerreotypes, and then eventually dry plates, and everything went went completely uh, bonkers when they when dry plate came around. Because then we got, you know actual like gelatin negatives and, and that sort of fun stuff well the, um, carbon, the carbon process you know that i practiced was basically perfected around 1865 and then uh albumin uh was also mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh eggs was, eggs mm -hmm. eggs mm -hmm. egg whites. That's actually, yeah egg, egg whites yeah <laughs> don't use the yolks ladies and gentlemen don't use the yolks i've actually been that's one of the ones that's also sort of fascinates me i like the idea of the old the old air quotes processes, the traditional processes, however you want it to call them, that can be primarily done with household ingredients, right? Like egg whites, cool. Um, you know, citric acid, we use it for canning, uh, hydrogen peroxide. You know, there's really basic things with like a smidge of something special, like obviously sil silver or, or whatever else. But those are the ones that really kind of fascinate me you know cyanotypes um i think there's i think there's a lot to be said to, with doing the older stuff like that because you learn a lot that you wouldn't learn otherwise right 
Absolutely. The, yeah, and, and common ingredients are, uh, you know, are, are really wonderful. I mean, even in developers, uh, one of the, you know, newest uh, introductions in film developers was um, was the one that used uh, vitamin uh, C, sorbic acid. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and that's a, uh, you know, great, great, uh, you know, because you can drink vitamin C. I mean, people take it, so it's not very dangerous at all. It reduces a lot of the, uh, uh, well, there are not too many risks in uh, the film developers, but there are some. So. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I guess the other thing we could, I'm, I'm sort of curious about, because it goes back to um, your study of Spanish pictorialism, is it seems to me like lately there've been a, there's been a swing back towards, um, like we talked about a little bit before the show, sort of a softer, more um, surreal form of, of imagery, right? Like we're swinging back to away from sort of the F64 group and the really like everything's in focus, fear tonality, to people that seem to be discovering sort of a, a surreal sort of softer pictorial type of photography nowadays, at least in large format. Do you see that in, in like the, the trends and, and as a person who's studied and possibly done both, um, what do you think about that? Well, that's, that's not, um, that, that really, that swing started in, um, in the pre-digital area era, maybe in the, in the seventies at universities, they started, you know, exploring, uh, teaching, you know, the alternative printing processes. And, mm-hmm. um, in 1979, there was a seminal book uh, published by William Crawford called Keepers of Light, which is a wonderful book, not only for doing a great survey of the different printing processes of history, but also of, of uh, explaining the importance of the various uh, syntactical components of a photograph, such as its sheen, color, uh, relief, and so forth. And that book had a tremendous impact on uh, the teaching of photography and mm-hmm. in colleges and universities, which which has spawned a lot of, of the uh, of that book because a lot of these people do uh, emerge from from that environment. They may you know had a teacher who who taught them these things, and uh, that also included the um, the look, uh, the pictorial look. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's late ni- it's late nineteenth century in origin, but you know it it, it was totally uh, um, negated. You know, until in the age of modernism with uh, the work of Edward Westwood. But we we've come a long, long way uh, since the eighties in that sense. And uh, and I nowadays it's uh, like wow, it's all sorts of manifestations that you can find on the web. People doing serious work, you know, with with uh, funny f- funky lenses and you know with straight uh, you know very sharp uh, photography. I tend to be you know one of the latter groups uh, because mm-hmm. my process is one that really does uh, uh, love fine detail and uh, relief, and so um, so I, I work hard to do that. But uh, you you can't deny that it you know the soft focus. Uh, the lens induced uh, aberrations is, is, is fascinating. I wonder if there's any sort of way you could shoot right down the middle, you know, to, to like have a good combination of like, uh, and I'm struggling to remember all, you know, it's been a little while since I was in university as Simon would say, <laughs> to get all the proper terms um, for the different movements of photography, but sort of the, the hard edged fully tonal zone system um, that was spearheaded by, you know, F64 and Ansel Adams and that group um, with the softer pictorial look, like if, if, if someone at some point in time can like take those two and just squish them together and like make a really interesting hybrid of the two. Um, or if somebody already has done that. Well, some people, you know, do both kinds of work. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, if, uh, my friend that I mentioned, um, who was a who was a professor with me at Clemson University, Sam Wong, he, he does both kinds of work. He does sharp, um, you know, mm-hmm. cutting edge, and then he does a lot of the, the kind of uh, images with uh, lenses that he crafts, like you do. So it, you know, you don't have to do. It's not one of the, uh, of the same thing. Although at, at any given point, uh, 
as as you know, artists who would be practicing, as we are attracted to different things, which is yeah. you know normal, I think, because you know we we were you know as I said, photography was born uh, you know as experimentation, and, and, and we all continue to you know be motivated by that um, mm -hmm. spirit. And then you also for a while made cameras. Oh, sorry, Simon, I just totally remembered that. I was, was going to say if I if I can just uh, this be, just carries on with that subject a little bit more. Um, and uh, and that's a case of you know, re reading about you. You you um, pretty much in your earlier photography, uh, I believe you were you were more towards the pictorialist um, type of photography. And as you've mm -hmm. said now, um, you're you're far more interested in recreating what you see in front of you um and detail and 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 so on um i hope i've paraphrased it correctly um and i'm just i'm just interested in that journey going from yeah. almost like one extreme to the other well let me slightly correct that my my um my writing was primarily focused on uh pictorialism as as a movement and i'm, I'm i continue to be highly interested in it uh, from a conceptual uh, perspective, you know, the reasons why people choose to do that, the fact that it uh, brought itself into uh, into the art world in that way and, and the conflicts that it has. I mean, that's extremely interesting. Um, but, but my own personal work there has always been, um, uh, how shall I say, you know, the look for the very uh, sharp, you know, image. Okay. Uh, that's true in silver, and I did platinum and palladium, and I did Van Dyke, and I do carbon. So, I, you know, my, uh, but I, but I, you know, that's basically, you know, it's, yeah. but it's not a, it's not a dichotomy to me. It's like it's well, I'm, I'm interested in, in all of these things, but my writings have, have explored more of the. Uh, Pictorial, you know, in Spain and also in China, the handcrafted, which, mm -hmm. which, which typically takes so many different uh, forms. I mean, it, and it usually involves a lot of uh, uh, handwork, and uh, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, sharp. Some of these old processes uh, lend themselves to, you know, handwork, and, um, and you know, but um, I, I'll feel, I feel. The, the I feel mostly a part of work that involves handcrafted prints. Uh, yeah. So, however you do that, it doesn't matter to me. I just appreciate the fact that somebody takes the time to to transfer an image, whether it be on mm -hmm. uh, silver film or in digital, from from that form to a tangible physical logic on, on paper. That's an important uh, step in the process to me. Because digital, uh, digital uh, itself, if you just do, print, uh, you know, digital images and put, put them on the web, well, that always privileges certain components of, of an image, you know, the graphic content, the emotional content, at the expense of uh, the syntactical elements that mm -hmm. exist in a physical object, an art form that's on paper where you have to, you know, look at the sheen, the texture, the color, and so forth. So that's what, that's, you know, I I, tr I, I strive, to, you know, I do digital, I do digital negatives, it's primarily what I do these days. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't do digital just for looking at it on the screen, I always change it to a physical form, either in printing on an inkjet printer or Typically, you know, my carbon process is what I do most of the time. Right. And have you found, um, I've found at least over the last five or six or even 10 years, it's scary to think it's 10 years now, um, that a lot of the, I'll call them the younger generation, you know, 10 years ago, they were in high school. So they're in their 20s now, seem to be very, very interested in film because they grew up completely digital. Like as kids, they grew up with computers, they grew up with phones, they grew up with iPads. Mm -hmm. And the thought of actually producing a physical work that they could hold in their hand was endlessly fascinating to them. If they saw a film camera, they're like, film camera. Or if you, even an Instax camera, that, that, you know, Fuji's 
cheap alternative to the Polaroid and you pull it out and they're like, um, and so it, it seems things seem to be swinging back a little bit, I guess is what I'm saying. Have, have you found that with, you know, any of the younger photographers you interact with or, or folk? Uh, well, here's the thing. I don't interact with a lot of, uh, younger people these days I interact mostly with people my age, but I definitely have observed this in the, in the writings and on the forums uh, and, and in the commercial aspects, uh, lamography, uh, all mm-hmm. the things. Uh, yeah, be, uh, young people are fascinated with this uh, more physical uh, uh, object because, you know, they, they're, t- they're tired of, um, you know, to some extent of um, the digital aspect. And, and that was true of me when I was a professor and had to write a lot. You know, I, I, I waited a long time before I took the, the leap into um digital photography because I didn't want to spend any more time, you know, at the computer, you know, yeah. so absolutely. I mean, and I, and it's, it's, it's warranted. I mean, it's, you know, working with film and, and film cameras is, is at the heart of, um, of our experience and of the history of photography. So it's wonderful that it's, it's coming back. I, I think a lot of people have, uh, on um, unreal expectations of what they're going to get when they when they when they use a film camera. That's, yeah, that's a fact but too. And, yeah, because <laughs> it's easy to mess it up, and you don't know if you've messed it up until well after you've messed it up, and that moment is that's right is, is gone. Yeah, right. But there is, you know, something about that that you know you have to. For example, if you're making some of these processes that are one off, and you, you've got to set the light up. You just get one chance to get it, and, uh, mm-hmm. and you know you learn if you just get one chance to do something, and you really want to do it. If you if you screw up, well, you, you better you know fix it next time. So, yep. so I think that's uh, <laughs> the, that's the beauty of uh, failure is always a great inspiration to um, yes <laughs> to improve our technique. <laughs> Speaking from personal experience, yes, yes, it is. I just tried to do cyanotypes in camera. I got absolutely nothing. And then I realized, oh, yeah, I use coded lenses most of the time for the obvious reasons that they're better for film. And I think this handmade lens has coded lenses. Well, crap. Yeah, they, better... they block a lot of the uh, UV light that you need. Yeah, exactly. So I've got to scramble around amongst my random collection of of glass optics to try to find something that I can I can make a lens with today. Um, or if you're doing it indoors, you can just illuminate the subject with a high uh, UV light UV light source. You know, like the LEDs yeah. low, you get floods that have uh, nothing but uh, UV light, and that might compensate to some extent for the right. uh, the lens itself absorbing the UV light. Yeah, I might end up doing that. I have a a little um, eight by ten contact sheet printer. You know, one of the Kodak ones is a box, and you just mm-hmm. um, that I put four uh, LED UV bulbs in to make a little home like UV exposure unit. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, mostly for chlorophyll prints. I just, I'm trying to do a chlorophyll print on a zucchini leaf, a squash leaf. First mm-hmm. couple of attempts were not so good because they just dried out and crisped outside. So, so far it's, it's like God knows how many hours of illumination because I only turned this thing on. It was probably made in the fifties. I don't trust the electrical wiring in it at all. They're like crunchy. You know how the old wires, it looks like they're going to fall apart. I feel like it's going to explode literally any minute now into like a burst of flame. So I only turn it on when I'm in the office and I can watch it and smell, smell smoke basically. Um, well, a nice little UV flood uh, would be, would be a good uh, thing to have because you can stay on all night and all day. And, you know. Yep. And the, you know we have them outside now all the time. Uh, you could maybe find a a night light and, and go, go <laughs> get a step ladder and get close to the to the light because they put out a lot of light that's good. They do well. Everybody's growing a particular herbal nowadays, which means there's a, a huge business in UV lighting. Yes, that, that well, you never. That's not happening in South Carolina. So. Well, okay, fair. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, because for traditional printing, it used to be you'd have to go get these huge ballast UV lights that were hugely expensive and were only found, I think, maybe in T-shirt printing processes and stuff. Yeah, screen printing. 
Yeah. And they were just a giant pain in the butt. And now it's like, oh, you want UV light? How big? How small? Like, right. just have, strings of them. Have those grow lights. That- yeah, for super cheap. It's <laughs> kind of ironic and hilarious. Well, that- I, was talking, I, I was having a thread on the large format forum. I don't know if you visit that, but uh, there was a guy who we were talking about the um, LED lights that, mm-hmm. that are good for uh, for uh, for you printing with the alternative printing process, I use them now in my own work. And uh, so we were talking about floods, and somebody commented, "Well, they they're they're popular because now in cheap because they're used uh, for Halloween and partying." And and I and I thought to myself, "Well, who would ever thought that uh, you know." Printing uh, these old processes would be at the intersection of modern technology and art. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but, exactly. But, but we do. We we do. Uh, we, we benefit from innovations like that in photography uh, because the old lights, like my God, we were using carbon arc lamps. That yeah. Uh, that it and uh, make a big, big, huge smoke and uh, could physically blow up in your face. And yeah. the metal halide lamps put out a huge amount of, of heat and radiation, so you have to be careful with them. They're good for you know our work, but uh, LED, LED lights are um, are fantastic. On the other hand, the uh, LED light is a is basically a single uh, bandwidth, and mm-hmm. so it you know if you're if you're out of the range for the process, it's not going to work. So yep. you need to find out what the range is for your whatever process you want to work, like the cyan type, is probably like 390 nanometers, and you, you get a flood for that. Light. Yep. Yeah, these UV lights are 395 to 400 nm. They're like right, boop, right there. They just have such a low output because they're just, you know, inexpensive, you know, whatever that it's taken some time, you know. But on the other hand, they're low heat, so they haven't crisped the leaf. That's right. It, they're, so, they're, they're, they're really great in that respect. Yeah, like the leaf after three days is still supple, you know, which I'm, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, okay. So mm-hmm. I might burn down the house, but until I burn down the house, the leaf is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck with that. Keep going. It's a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a grind. I, I now understand, like, why the people who do this type of printing really, really well use the big banana leaves because they're super robust. They don't shrink, mm-hmm. and they have a very particular process. Mm-hmm. You know, they can stick them outside in a high sun and not worry about the leaf just like going to complete crap. Now, I, I get it now. <laughs> um, but I also, you, so recently, I, I, I also have a fascination with making cameras because I'm a glutton for punishment. And I have a fascination with panoramic cameras because also a glutton for punishment. Um, and I was looking around thinking, okay, maybe I'll make a four by 10, a big fat four by 10. But the big, the big blocker for me for those are film holders. Commercial four by 10 film holders are ungodly expensive and rare. And I stumbled across some threads where I think you, sir, used to produce large format film holders and occasionally cameras as well. And then that sort of, I went to your website. I think the first time I went to your website, I was like, does he still have film holders? No. (laughs) So did you also like at some point in time dabble in building cameras and or film holders? Well, I sure did. And, uh, I, uh, I built, uh, uh, I built an eight by 10 and, uh, uh, 11 by 14 and a 20 by 24 camera. Uh, basically, to to a design similar to to one of my lightweight five by seven cameras, all of them have you know kind of followed the same uh, same same. Thing. So I, I'm I'm I've been very interested in uh, woodworking and uh, uh, okay sort of uh, outdoor you know well indoor whatever you call it and uh, and I got and I bought a uh, and and my friend Sam Wong that I mentioned he was also involved in uh, really big cameras. This was back in the 90s, and we were mm-hmm. uh, very hard to find uh, film holders back then because they were uh, they were produced. Most of the ones you could find were produced when those cameras were popular back in the 20s and 30s. Right. So they're, they're 70, 80 years old then. So 
we we had a friend um, in uh, I think it was in um, he started a small college in uh, Bristol, uh, Tennessee that's since gone out of business. And but he had a woodworker there, and he got him to make some film holders for his for his specialized camera. And my friend Sam and I said, well, let's ask. Uh, Richard, if he can make some for us, and he made some for us, and, and they were of such good quality. He actually had been a woodworker for, you know, very fine carved things that would sell okay. uh, in the airports, and uh, that kind of went out of business, you know, after 2001, so he he didn't, he, you know, he was a woodworker in search of, uh, you know, making fine, specialized things like that, so... We, we got him involved in uh, making these things for us. And so we created a, 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 a company called SNS Film Holders. And uh, we have, uh, we made them for uh, about 10 years. And then uh, the business kind of sloped off after the depression in 2008. Uh, but we didn't stop making them immediately. But, uh, but my friend and I, we just got... But basically, we were finishing them off because he didn't understand the, the importance of the uh, light baffle. Right. So we were finishing them off. Really, like the most intimidating thing is, and we can sort of go back and do it, but the most intimidating thing of building a, a sheet film camera in an odd size is the bloody film holder, right? Because that's a very specialist piece yeah. to build. It has to have like the perfect fold in of the, the, all the things. And I do a little bit of woodworking, very amateurish, you know, for the, the lens barrels for some of the large format lenses. I do the wood, the barrels are wood because it's fun, you know, and I have no ability to work in metal. Um, but man, I've looked at, at film holders. I'm like, there's just no way I could make a film holder. No, no, they're, very, they're, they're very difficult to make. I had made several cameras, but, uh, uh that level was uh, uh, skill was beyond me. That's why we've got you know the woodworker. But uh, in terms of the old, the wide format, uh, real wide, uh, panoramic, uh, mm-hmm. the real cat's meow on that are the swing uh, cameras. Yeah, such as the no blacks or the wide locks. Uh, and of course, those those can be made too. You know, people can you know can can create that mechanism and and make that. But it's a it's it's a little harder to do, but uh, yeah. But I I mean those are you know I have a Noblex uh, that does uh, six by twelve and mm-hmm. it's just remarkably sharp air everywhere. Yeah, it's a zone focusing thing because it's a fifty yeah. you know, lens. It's a, it's a Tessar lens, but you know that lens in that in, in space is very sharp. I did a lot of that of that work about about ten years ago. Yeah, because either that or it's the uh, still zone focus, but um, fixed lens. I guess you could say like the the Fuji six seventeen mm-hmm. um, or six nineteen actually, or um, wider lens that are conversions of the old Kodak three A postcard cameras, mm-hmm. which convert very nicely to a six by thirteen, right? Because it was a five and a half inch wide negative. Yeah. Um, I actually have one of those that I converted to shoot. And then also I just got and just had rehabbed a Graphlex 3A postcard SLR, which is going to go shoot for panoramic, but still like, it's not the true panoramic. It's like the big panoramic, like six by 17. There's an aspect ratio, like six by 12 doesn't quite do it for me. Six by 13 is barely panoramic, but if you want real panoramic, you want to have a, like, Bam, 617, 619, 618, like yeah. the, the big beast, you know, where it's one to three. Well, they had like circuit cameras with 80 inch film, you know, at one time. Mm-hmm. Those were like, wow. Uh, yeah. That's an incredible, incredible look. And um, wow, I just can't imagine, you know, the skill that it took to manufacture something with that precision to go around and give even exposure on mm-hmm. big film over such a wide range. It used to be just springs. Like the original Kodak Panoram was just a spring. As I recall, um, those are really cool. By the way, I still want one. Um, <laughs> well, such- I, I've I've tried to print, you know, though, it, you know, in, in carbon prints with some negative made to those things, and they were just just unbearable because they didn't the spring wasn't calibrated and would be dark and light points. And yeah, because they get old. 
they blame it on the, you know, the process. And I'd say, well, look here in the negative. You can see that there's a big uh, fog area here. Honey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're cool cameras in the old curved wood and like mahogany. Like they're really, and they're actually fairly small. First time I held one, I was like, this is actually a pretty small little beast. But there's so many of them that aren't functional anymore, unfortunately. And you don't know what spring it was. You know, and so finding the right spring to replace the old spring and redoing it all. It's not the same as just gears where you can wind and you feel somewhat safe um, in their consistency, right? Yeah. Well, you know, when you get involved with these things, you have to make the choices. You know, what do I really want Mm -hmm. to spend my time, you know, redoing, making cameras or, you know, or working otherwise. So it's it's like I love to do I love woodwork and I love to mm-hmm. mess around and uh, I do a lot of it. So. Yeah, same. Exactly. Like I would, I would rather spend time and this is where like, I think I diverge from yourself and, and Simon and Andrews. I, I'm not really that interested in the dark room. Mm-hmm. I, I love figuring out ways to develop film and ways the film shouldn't be developed. Um, you know, pushing orthochromatic film, way past the speed it should be pushed and getting a good image. Like I like that sort of stuff and I really enjoy building camera lenses and wood and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But like doing, spending time in the darkroom printing um, when I could just sort of digitally change the file and just print as many as I need without doing the same thing over and over again. Well, that's, that's you basically know. what I do. And I don't work in the dark room. I, I work in, it's the dim room. It's just, you know, I, I make the negatives and then I, <laughs> what, you know, a process that I use right. is uh, like slow. So I don't have to work. And I, and most of what I do is transformative in, on the, on the screen, you know, cause I, what I found was, uh, I had a huge archive of five by seven negatives when I made the switch from, uh, you know, developing and, and exposing and making prints with film to digital and I had to learn how to scan and then uh, and then and then recreate those negatives so that they print like the film negatives did. But then I found that uh, not only could I, you know, recreate, I could create tonal ranges and possibilities that were way out of way beyond what I could do uh, with film, which is one of the things that got me motivated to to learn to make really good uh, uh, you know, digital negatives, and uh, it's been a long uh, struggle because I didn't, I didn't start it until I was already, um, you know, pretty old, and, uh, and and this the digital stuff. Fortunately, I learned it when I was, you know, very young, so I'm having advantage over uh, most people my age who are kind of lost with it. But it's still quite a, quite a struggle. You know, Photoshop is uh, is, is a beast. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so if you were going to give, like, if we're going to start to wind down, sorry, the coffee maker is going, but if, you, if we're going to start to wind down, like, what do you think the, the best takeaway advice for folks who want to get into alternative processes, be it um, carbon printing or, you know, fine tuning their negative, like what, what, what would, it, what advice would you give them? Like, where would you start? Well, it depends if, you know, fine-tuning your negative, they're probably uh, they're people who you know, specialize in making digital negatives and uh, websites that you can find uh, about that. Uh, you know, you can do, uh, you can do YouTubes on uh, cyanotype printing. Uh, I mean, look, we have such wide resources available to young photographers today, right. YouTube that did not exist at all when I was, uh, you know, in my 30s. I mean, uh, none of this stuff was out there. Not even the ability to, to communicate by email was out there. So uh, you, you, you just have to, you know, look at what you want to do and do a little research as to what resources are out there that are, that are free and then determine, um, well, can you do that with what's free? And uh, some things you can, some things you cannot. You, you cannot learn to, to, to make carbon printing w- with free resources. It's just too, too complicated. Uh, so, you know, there are some things that if you want to learn, you just have to, you know, get on, a, get on the phone and find out who's the best resource in the world and, and go there and, and beg that uh, they, they teach you. 
Uh, but most things you can learn on YouTube. So I would say that you know, try to try to determine how complicated it is. I mean, a big mistake that many people make is they don't understand what is really involved. And you know, if you could talk to somebody before you launch into this uh, uh, endeavor, you know, do that and try to kind of evaluate for yourself. Well, is am I the person that wants to put time into that or you know, bearing in mind that there's so many other things that we can do in life. And so the more informed you are about something, the, the higher chance that you're going to be successful with it. So just be informed. Just get, just learn about it. Right. So before you like, dive into the deep end of something, have, have some little bit idea of just how deep that deep end is, which, by the way, is um, famously infamous for not doing that research at all. Yeah, because in there's one, you know there's one guy. He's he, his his mother was a Russian and she died from this. But he, it's called, you know, deep, deep dives, and they they go down. He goes like a, I think it's a hundred and twenty meters down, and he can hold his breath for nine minutes. Well, that's that's wonderful. His mother died from it, and we can't all do that. So you know, don't go out there and. <laughs> and try these things. <laughs> don't be like me, gentle readers, <laughs> listeners. Don't be like yeah, me. On the other hand, I mean, just, you know, <laughs> just messing around with stuff. You know, don't don't be afraid of you know taking a little test and doing like what you're doing with the exposure. See, it doesn't. You know, it's overnight, and you're not involved with it. So do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sandy, on 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 that note, um, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you with us. So thank yeah, thank you very dear. much for spending the time with us this afternoon. Yes, so well. morning or this morning even. Morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's been it's been both for me. It's uh, it's now afternoon. It was morning when we started. <laughs> <laughs> they both work <laughs> excellent um right then uh, if people want to see your work and potentially get in touch with you or anything like that what's what's the best way for that to happen well um i have a website uh it's uh sandy king dot com and uh and it's it's still working i haven't uh, updated it in a while but there's a contact uh form to there that you can contact me at i'm having a little trouble with with uh with uh spam right now been coming to it to me from you know to my clemson edu address so uh, uh and then also uh, in other ways i have uh, uh i have a lot of writing materials there on the website you know technical writing uh, how to do cat calotypes how to do van dykes uh, how to do pyro the Pyro article is there. So I have a lot of uh, resources on the website. It's not just about uh, showing my work. It's about uh, you know trying to get people interested. In yeah. It. yeah, it's a tremendous resource. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I also moderate uh, on uh, it's the groups.io. I have a far, uh, carbon uh, forum, a carbon uh, uh, forum where we discuss. It is about eight, five, five or six hundred members. It's you know the groups are not as popular as they were now that Facebook is out. But uh, I have that resource for carbon printing, and I participate still on the um, the uh, large format forum, um, which is I guess you've seen that you know forum. It's a not forum. It's a it's a it's a it's a group discussion. It's been around since the. Uh, since the late 90s or early 2000s. And, uh, and, and a lot of people there uh, are very experienced in uh, cameras. And then they, some of us don't do much uh, with, you know, the film anymore. But, you know, yeah. many people there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, have forgotten more than most people ever when you, when you search for large format stuff, nine times out of ten, that form is in the top three or four results still. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and, and it's the people there. Many of them are very, uh, very skilled, and they and they they, they they're old time users. Uh, you know, some of them have been there for you know fifteen or twenty years. So those are the uh, three main. Uh, I do not. Um, I'm sorry to say, I I do not. Uh, I I do not have any Facebook presence, uh, and I I made that decision. Uh, 
deliberately a long time ago. Uh, I do I do read the forums. I mean the various discussion groups, but I don't uh, I don't I don't actively use uh, uh, Facebook. If it's a public forum, I go there sometimes and uh, and, and look at materials like alternative photography and uh, and, uh, and there's a carbon uh, you know discussion forum there. But uh, but I. Uh, I, I, you know, I have lots of personal uh, reasons that I didn't choose to to join that uh, uh, forum when it when it was created. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. Uh, is is Jim Fitzgerald in there? I don't know if you know if you know Jim Fitzgerald. Jim is Jim is uh, yes. He occasionally uh, well, he 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 actually participates more in the Facebook for forum on carbon than uh, than than in the other. But he he is there. Yeah. He's, he's a very good, um, uh, you know, traditional carbon printer. He uses, you know, big film. Big oh, we, 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 we know Jim well. We, he's, he was a guest of ours last year. Was it last year? I think it was last year. It was last year. Yeah. 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 yeah he's, a, he's a great person. And, uh, and I've, I've met him and worked with him. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I love his work. And I, and I love the, the aesthetic, you know, the concept that he has of working. You know, with the big camera and nature, because I, you know, I did that, you know, myself for a long time, and I, I basically it was wonderful. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad, you know, and he's still doing it. Von Hutchinson, Hutchins is still doing it with the big cameras. He's a good friend of, uh, of Jim. Right. Um, okay, well, let's quickly do shout outs, Eric. Have you got any shout outs? I haven't actually gotten a shout out to a large format related really? this week. No, not this week. Oh. Well, besides my long-suffering fiance Heather, who puts up with my shenanigans, hello dear. Um, I definitely, actually, uh, a shout out uh, to um, Nicole White and the Diablo Valley College, uh, where I'm taking the experimental photography course. I'm actually it's pushing me into some interesting places I haven't played with, and it's kind of fun. Um, weirdly enough. Uh, so that's that's been that's been really great, I think. Yeah, I think that's 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 the big one. If if you're in the Bay Area, actually, in a lot of the photography courses right now are remote. They've got a really great photography program over there, um, and Nicole has been building it out and spearheading it for a few years now. And they're about to actually have a brand new facility with probably the best darkroom facility in the Bay Area. So, where is um, that? Diablo Valley College. It's right out over here uh, in the East Bay, the San Francisco Bay area. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, they're doing great things. I f- I'm finding more and more really fantastic photography programs amongst the smaller community colleges. And, you know, it's, I think it's awesome. Um, I, I was going to say, Sandy, I don't know if you've got any shout outs because you've actually mentioned a few other people, but if there's anybody else that you yeah. want to know, uh, say on top of all the other people that you've uh, mentioned already. Well, I will, we really want to, you know, shout out to uh, Jim Fitzgerald because I mean he's you know been on your program and he's a person that uh, whose work I I do 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 you know respect a lot and appreciate the kind of work that he does. So that just a big shout out to Jim would be enough. Yeah, that's cool. cool. Yeah, Jim's great. Right. Well, in that case, um, we we know how to get hold of Sandy. Um, how do we get hold of you, Eric? Uh, mostly Instagram. Very not that many bunny photos on Instagram nowadays. Uh, all the bunnies and, and, are out of the house. Still no large format bunny photos either. I, I'll add. No, it. they don't sit still. You've Find said that before. But you have a speed don't. graphic. Speed, speed. That's why. That's why it's called Which, speed graphic. For people who've used it, they know it's not actually that speedy. <laughs> but um, Eric, that, you're right those, are, those are press cameras. You know, they they took yeah. the picture and they had it ready. And, and exactly. <laughs> I'm not Ouija, okay? You it know, was, and he shot corpses. They were they were not moving. Eric, Eric, you're a photojournalist. Come on, get a grip. That's why we use medium <laughs> format, my friend. Oh. Or digital for my, my, my folks who are still out there actually in the field doing the work. They all shoot digital. Um, fine, I will eventually figure out a way to get the bunnies that sit still long enough for a large format photograph. It will involve bribery, of food, actually, they're very food oriented. What? Yeah. Doesn't that involve drugs? Yeah, Heather says it's going to involve drugs. We need to knock them out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
It's like just like <laughs> Excellent. feed them something that's CBD based. I don't know, but um, E R I K H M A T H Y on Instagram as usual. Um, so okay. and right now, lots of photos of alternative processes. Right. Well, okay. I just want to say it's been a lot of uh, fun to, uh, chatting with you guys. You got a lot of humor there, and uh, <laughs> it, uh, I, I appreciate the varied kind of interest and in, in interaction. So, thank you very much. Or, uh, it's been great. Yeah, Sandy, you, you, you're a great guest because your 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 knowledge spans many areas, and um, and it's it's, <laughs> it's it's great to be able to just delve into different areas and get you know, really good answers. <laughs> to be completely random and have you be like, oh yeah, that like, yes. <laughs> well, I I mentioned before, you know, there are things about uh, these processes like special power cat. Sometimes I I read. Somebody posts one of my uh, replies from 10 years ago, and I look at it, and I say, did I really write that? <laughs> uh, but I'm a little, man, my memory is, you know, a little, not not great, but uh, I I still, um, you know, it's, my mind still uh, can figure out new problems. <laughs> so, anyway, it has been fun. Yeah, no, it's been great. And just to, uh, my contact things are instagram i'm simon forster photographic i'm on twitter as simon four um i have a website which is simon forster photographic.co.uk where you can buy lots of things for camera accessories um such as lens caps or well, it's mainly lens caps actually um i still keep on threatening to do lens boards um and i if you get in touch with me and you got a lens board you need making I might be able to help you, um, but I'm not quite ready yet to make them commercially, if you like, but I'll do them as, as one-offs. Um, also, really busy uh, making things for the uh, the guys that behind Veloy, the, um, the camera scanning, semi-automated camera scanning uh, device. Uh, because I've been making uh, masks for them to do like things like 110 APS, 127 panoramics, and... and sprocketless and things like that uh which which is they'll be selling those soon as well as doing some more things for pixelator as well um so yeah so been very very busy lately um so enough about me um emails if you want to get in touch with the show eric what's the best way to do that that is a good question man you're you're cool it is large format photography podcast at gmail.com excellent excellent That's i keep stumbling over i include the in front of it yeah every time yeah. every time but you get you do get there so that's, that's that's the main thing you do better at that than i usually do at introducing our guests so. which you nailed this time by the yeah, way so first very- time ever in my experience totally proud of that um should so, be uh other things our <laughs> music is by kevin mcleod and it's called two fingered johnny um if you want to support the podcast um you can uh, make a donation to us at coffee.com that's ko-fi.com and somehow find us uh, because apparently we're still not very easy to find but some people manage occasionally um and when we do our next catch-up show we'll uh, say thank you to those people specifically and do emails and things like that um so so that's it so i hope you've enjoyed this week's show and so goodbye thank you very much goodbye goodbye